Thank you. Uh, now we have a second panel of the day. I already see a couple of people here. So I guess, yeah, you guys can come up on stage. Uh, we're going to talk about the best use cases for Deepin. And the panel is going to be moderated by Mihai, who I saw uh, just a second ago. And then Simone is here. Philip is here. You guys are here. Uh, who are we missing? Yeah, please, guys, come up on stage and then uh, we'll get the rest. Let's see. Philip is there. Daniel is there. We're just missing Altan and Mihai. But Mariella is looking for them. So thank you guys for sticking around. What's up? Oh, showtime. <laughs> How are you guys enjoying so far? I mean, do you, are, can you hear when they're talking? Like is, it resonates? Okay, great. I have to speak closer to the mic. Okay, good, good. <laughs> uh, okay. What if... Um, mm, 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 let me think. I think we need a moderator to start, and then maybe... Uh, otherwise, I could do it. But uh, Mihai was just uh, here. I just saw him. And uh, I didn't see Alton around. How about uh, we take like a uh, couple of minutes to find the people? You guys stay here. Ah, that's a good point for Simone. Uh, oh, Mihai, if you hear me, can you come up on stage? Also, do you guys have any questions so far? I mean, there's been a lot of talks. There's been presentations, panel. Is there anything that you want to ask some of these panelists while we're here? Uh, it can also be non deepen related, you know, like what's what's their favorite food or where to go eat in uh, Brussels or uh, IOTEX related, like, you know, when one dollar or, you know, things like that. Okay, no, very, very shy. Oh, there he is. All right, what an entrance. Last call for Mihai. All right, uh, it's all yours, man. I think we're missing Altan, but I think we can get started and then uh, figure it out. Test. Stop. All right. Three, two, one. Are you ready for the panel? All right, very good. I like the energy. Hello, everyone. This is uh, Mihai from Masari. I run uh, protocol research. And um, I focus on Deepin. So today I got with me three panelists and uh, we're going to speak about viability of uh, Deepin protocols out there. Without further ado, I'm going to ask my panelists to shortly introduce themselves, their project, uh, and to tell us what is their USP. Simone, how about we start with you? Thank you, Mihai. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am Simone Romano, leading uh, developer relations at IOTEX. And uh, IOTEX uh, has been working since 2018 on the intersection and connection uh, of blockchain with the uh, physical world uh, machines and data. And uh, along the uh, way, we have uh, worked until we uh, came to our uh, fully modular infrastructure for helping deep in projects to uh, get launched and grow easily. Yeah, that's it. So hello everyone, my name is Philip. Um, I am not a part of any particular project except doing my PhD, which I would say is also a long running project. During uh, the ECC, I already had a chat with a couple of teams and actually one of the good comments they made like PhD is actually like starting your own project because you are like a founder that you are coming up with the idea, you have to pitch it to the academic uh, people and at the end you have to work on it for a couple of years until you graduate. Uh, when it comes to the research itself, I am uh, focusing on the building blocks actually that are used inside of several deepins. So namely it's uh, regarding trusted execution environments, threshold cryptography, consensus, and many others. So in that sense, it's nice to see on how the individual building blocks can be combined in order to make a robust system that is definitely useful uh, for the future. Hey guys, my name is Daniel. 
I am the co-founder of Hotspotty, and we are now building a website called Deepin Hub. I've been in crypto since 2011. Uh, I have a background in electrical engineering, and but it was only after I understood what Deepin is, actually what Helium, four years ago, is that I decided to go all in into crypto because I could really understand the value that crypto is building. I was very early on Bitcoin, very early on Ethereum, but actually the passion for really going full-time all in in crypto was after I understand what Helium was trying to do. And now with like the idea of deep in decentralized infrastructure, it's a much, much broader world that we are living in right now. And we're trying to, to bridge the gap between the users, the real users, the normies, like a lot of people say in the crypto world, and the deep in projects, making deep in very accessible and bringing the opportunities to, to the whole world. So I think deep in is the ecosystem that actually going to make, you know, crypto mainstream. I'll go next. Sorry about being late. Um, I'm Altan, one of the co-founders of Nuffle Labs. Uh, we just spun out a NIR foundation and, and Pagoda, which is the labs team within NIR, uh, announced our 13 million raise three weeks ago. Um, yeah, we do. We have two products, which one of them is NIR DA that allows um, roll-ups to scale cheaply and in a very um, scale cheaply and uh, with high throughput. So we on the DA base layer, we have 24 megabytes per second, and that uh, basically scales with shards. And the other product we're building, which is, uh, it's quite like unique in a sense that you can use it for deepen projects, given uh, a lot of deepen projects need high throughput and they need to push a lot of data. And the other thing is we have a eigenlayer AVS that's built on top of near DA that can pretty much like aggregate state. Uh, so if you're a deepen project that launched a rollup, you can actually interact with another, let's say, OP ARB uh, and build those interactions uh, pretty fast and with, uh, with eigenlayer security. All right. Uh, thanks to each of you for your introductions. Uh, a very varied panel, so I expect a variety of answers from, from you. So the very first question from my side is, can you give me one example of a dip in that you think is going to change the world? Well, um, I'm starting. So I think this is a tough question because uh, Deepin is still uh, in a very early stage. I think any Deepin project uh, is astonishing in, the, in this stage to me. Uh, I could mention the usual suspects, right? In the connectivity, uh, and energy, right? Uh, data collection. I think there are many uh, interesting projects in these spaces. I can tell my personal preference, which is maybe a little bit uh, far, a little bit more, yeah, far in the future, which is that of autonomous devices. So when you can buy an autonomous car or an autonomous drone, just put it on the road, join whatever network it was uh, able, like compatible with and start earning from joining a, a decentralized Uber a delivery, a drone delivery system. I think these ones are the most exciting, although maybe we have to wait a couple of years more for them. Who wants to go next? Do, do you have any example of something closer to today, something more feasible today? What do you think? For us, like it, obviously not from, from our project. We work with IOTX, obviously, that's one thing. But the other thing is um, it's very interesting that everybody has mobile phones, right? I mean, that's one of the things that you can leverage uh, when you're building Deepin. Uh, one of the things I'm excited about personally is uh, edge computing. How do you sort of like use your devices to sort of uh, basically everybody does inference on their phone to be able to run a model. And how do you provide that back to something else to build something meaningful in a sense. So use your phones to build, do, do sort of uh, inference and provide that back to somewhere or some blockchain to be able to use that for, uh, for any uh, useful reason. There's a couple of projects there which we work with. Uh, one of them is Valence Labs. They have a L2 or XO is one of them as well that I like uh, essentially running, uh, being able to run a bunch of phones together uh, for an inference network. So that's quite exciting to me. I mean, this is a very tough question, right? There's so many different projects that I think are very interesting and different projects in different areas, right? Uh, there's one that I've, I've been 
getting closer to the team as well, that they're solving a big, big issue, which is water. You know, like uh, we don't really talk about water so much, but there's this project called Aquasafe that what they're doing is building like a decentralized way that you can measure water quality around the world, you know, in, in a timely manner every few 15 minutes or so. And we know that water is going to become very problematic in the next like 10 years plus. And these projects are already trying to like gather information to how does that the water quality is going to change over time. If there's a flooding, if there's something that happens in the city, you don't know. The government has zero interest actually in displaying when the water is bad. They just want to show when the water is good, right? So I have one project What they're trying to like build carbon credits, but for water. And, uh, and I think that's very, very interesting project. It's called Aquasafe. I think it's uh, interesting to, ch to take a look at. And looking at it from the academic perspective, we as a chair have a long running experience with reproducible experiments. And definitely where we see interesting aspect of applications of Deepin is when it comes to sharing infrastructure. Because currently each university, even within each university, each research groups is sometimes having certain infrastructure only used for their particular needs. So definitely leveraging the aspects of Deepin can, I think, bring all of the individual academics together, sharing such resources in a robust fashion. And I think this is definitely something that makes me uh, interested in the topic, because especially when it comes to pushing the boundaries of, of research aspects, it's important to find the aspects of sharing, but also at the same time, making it more accessible to other partners that maybe do not have the budget and do not have actually the enough capabilities to buy such type of dedicated specific hardware to push their research and later on they are using and relying on other third parties. So I think in that sense, it's interesting to see how these aspects can be brought together. Right, the speaking of uh, bringing things together. So I, I think these projects are visionary and they're very forward looking, but the question is all the time, are these projects going to be viable over the longer term? And uh, from my perspective as a researcher at Masari, I'm looking a lot of metrics of success of these projects. So I want to ask each of you, and uh, I'm going to start with you, Aldan. Um, what are like key performance indicators? What are metrics that are core to your business? Something that you track on a day-by-day -day basis? Yeah, so for our business, I guess, we, we care about the number of roll-ups that's on mainnet and testnet. Right, I'll, I'll go into uh, Deepin later. Essentially, we have one roll-up that's on mainnet. We have 15 sort of roll-ups come into testnet to use uh, near DA, and then that will eventually become mainnet. Uh, but the, the other thing is, I guess, from a Deepin perspective, um, how many devices you've sort of like connected to the network. Actually, the other thing is like maybe the, the, the amount of money you're paying for that hardware and then how much you're generating from there and then what's the cut there. So that makes sense, right? Like uh, on average, um, in that case, like you can sum that and then you get a network sort of maybe like profit in a sense, right? And I would assume probably some of the projects won't get there and some of them will. Um, so yeah, I mean, we've seen that quite happen. And those are the two things I think that comes to mind is the number of uh, connected devices and then on average, how much a device can make profit off of that. Simone, what do you look at? Uh, yeah, this is, uh, I think, a very in interesting question. Uh, actually, I I'm talking always from the in infrastructure perspective because that's what, uh, what we build. Uh, I think there are uh, different metrics. There are some metrics that are global for deep in, right? For example, the number of devices or machines uh, as well as the volume of rewards right, that these uh, projects generate for their users, the number of users. Uh, then there are other metrics that are more project specific that are interesting. If it's uh, a network connectivity project, then the uh, network coverage, or, or uh, if it's a data collection, uh, the volume or the quality of the data depends on, uh, on the type of project. I think one important thing we should mention is how are we going to measure right, these metrics? So far, if you watch the, the presentation before, most, if not all, deep in projects are running their, their logic in a centralized infrastructure. They are only distributing rewards on the blockchain. So you can only get or measure trusted aggregated numbers like what's the total amount of rewards that uh, this project is transferring right but can you actually measure or trust how much data they are processing 
how they are processing this data, how much like physical work has been really done and proven, uh, or how many devices are really being active, or uh, if you want, how much rewards every single device is generating to a user. This is important to trust this metric if you want to enter a device marketplace where I want to invest in an antenna and prove something, how much money this antenna is generating for me, if I want to sell the ownership or like rent that device to someone to earn money, maybe enter a DeFi application, right? To be able to do these trusted measurements, you have to move from centralized deep in to decentralized deep in, meaning a lot of infrastructure that I'm not going into details here, but that's what um, we are providing. And uh, yeah, Deepin projects should really look more into this decentralization aspect. Yeah. I can provide a perspective when it comes to actually really second the opinion of Simone when it comes to asking the fundamental question, actually, how do we measure the KPIs? Because when it comes to measuring KPIs on different chains, we see very different aspects when it comes to measuring throughput, latency, adoption, and many others. And with respect to that, actually, we are looking into the ways on how to come up with possibly some guidelines on actually how to find and measure fair metrics across different projects to be actually able to compare such type of aspects also under specific workloads, right? Because it's different if you have many small devices that are sending a smaller payloads of data that later have to be exchanged among the peers, or you are, for example, training an AR model. So this aspect, I think, have to be brought together and look into it from a different perspective because usually it's a matter of trade-offs when it comes to performance, security, decentralization, scalability, and many others. And I think nailing down really these individual measurements and a structured approach, methodological approach to actually have a fair comparison is something that uh, is something definitely to look into from my perspective. Yeah, I don't, I don't think necessarily the amount of devices online is a good metric, right? Because different projects, if your project just only have a cell phone to onboard a user, you can easily have like a few hundred thousand devices where you have to have a node that's very expensive. Um, one thing that I like to think about deep in is that projects should exist without the crypto aspect. The crypto is just an extra layer of incentive to onboard more people. So I like to think that for a, pro a deep in project to show real value is actually dollars outside of crypto come into that project, you know? Like for example, a, a great example is the project GeodNet. They already had customers eight, way before crypto and then crypto is actually the extra incentive to really bootstrap supply and then grow around the world. But if your project's not having anything related to real money coming to the project, then maybe you're just in the wrong market. Daniel, I absolutely love your answer. So as a matter of fact, there are many dipping projects out there that use token incentives to bootstrap the supply side of uh, the network. However, over time, there is the challenge of uh, actually having demand for the services that is sticky and uh, that will lead to value accrual longer term. So this is only one challenge of uh, um, many uh, dipping projects out there. So I would like to ask each of you, what do you think are other challenges when it comes to starting building viable Deepin networks? Yeah, I mean, uh, Deepin projects is hard, right? I think it's much harder than a lot of other crypto projects or different ecosystems. There's, first of all, there's this hardware aspect. You have electrical engineering, you need to build a device, this device, you know, manufacturing, fulfillment, supply chain, Hardware is hard. Hardware takes a long time to develop. And then you have, to, you have the crypto cycles around it, right? Maybe you are in the bull market. Everything seems hot. You think you're the most smartest you know, trader in the world and your project's going very well. But then by the time your device is ready, the market is already cold. That means that nobody wants to buy your device. You spend all this money on development. Um, I think it's re you really understand, you need to understand the crypto. You need to understand the fulfillment, manufacturing, and community all together. So I think in the technical and non-technical, it's quite complicated to have a successful deepening project. Luckily, there's a lot of projects trying, and there's a lot of projects, you know, like Peak IOTEX and other layer ones that are really focusing on trying to solve those, helping those founders. Um, but yeah, it's it's definitely not something easy that 
And that's what we're here for, right? To really try our best and make sure that uh, some, of, some of us survive. <laughs> Uh, definitely from the aspect that looking at it, I see the biggest challenge is security. Like at the end, there are many peers in the system that might be malicious, might be actually honest. And definitely looking into the aspects of security in the system is very crucial. Uh, very, I think, useful solution for that are trusted execution environments. That is something that we are actively looking into on different levels, either for processing and other aspects. And definitely this should be, I think, something looked into in more detail, not only trusted execution environments, but other cryptographic primitives that can be used in combination. And I think this will generally build and improve the adoption because we have to build a security ground up before such solutions will have, I think, more adoption from my perspective. Challenges, right? So uh, where to start? <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I think we can again split into uh, the current state of Deepin, what challenges they face and there may be the decentralized uh, stage of Deepin. So what challenges will they face? So currently, if you are interested in building a Deepin project, you are probably interested in IoT or even coming from the IoT system space. And so your obvious challenge, I mean, you are going to probably retain your current architecture. Your pro obvious challenge will be to get familiar with Web3 and what type of incentive uh, tokenomics you should design to make the flywheel of your DPN project to spin, right? And make it sustainable. Uh, it's not very different from other token economy, but has different uh, specific concepts that are related to the fact that you have a device, you have data, uh, and you have physical concepts into your application. So probably DPN tokenomics is the first challenge a Deepin project has to face. Next, you if you want to really become a decentralized Deepin project, meaning you want to achieve composability in the Web3 space, right? You want to uh, provide trust and transparency to your users and to the whole landscape ecosystem, then you are start facing a lot of more issues starting from how do I identify devices on chain? How do I identify or track the, the ownership or the decommissioning of devices on chain? How do I prove the deep in computation that I do on the actual device data before I decide how, what, how much rewards should I distribute? How can I prove this to the users? Am I expert in um, cryptographic schemes? Am I expert in uh, verifiable computation? Am I uh, an expert in uh, decentralized identities, decentralized identifiers, uh, decentralized ID documents, and all these things? These are a lot of challenges that deep in projects will, will have to face, if not now, in the future. Um, so these are, of, of course, challenges on the, on the technical side. There are other challenges on non-technical side, like regulations. I'm not talking about them. I'm not in my comfort zone here. So maybe let somebody else talk about it. Yeah, I'll start thinking from the system perspective. Um, so how do you, when you get the supply, how do you keep that supply going while you also need to get the demand? Uh, the other problem, uh, I have a sort of a, I studied computer science and AI back in uh, two, three years ago, my master's. One of the things you see is like, how do you build a system where it's almost like it is asynchronous, but looks like synchronous to outside? And um, it, keeping that with different devices and a different sort of, even if you're a deep in project running on AWS, how do you keep all of that sort of synced and, uh, and seems like almost one system outside versus you're using a sort of variety of devices? The other thing is like pretty much opportunity cost. Uh, a lot of hardware that sits everywhere can do anything, right? And we see this with, uh, we're close with the, we're within the Eigenlayer ecosystem. And you see this with the operators. They're kind of a deep in if you think about it. Like they use the sort of the Ethereum's uh, security to do something verifiable outside uh, of Ethereum. Um, so they, everybody, all the operators have some sort of an opportunity cost of if you're running a deep in project A, they'll look at the deep in project B. And then how does deep in project A actually differ from the Deepin Project B and you still want to stay in Deepin Project A. 
So that's the question that a lot of probably projects will have to answer and look at the competition and say, hey, we're actually better than these folks because X, Y, Z. And that's why uh, we have the better incentives for people to stay in the system. And that's basically going back to the, the same problem of supply and demand and how do you meet that sort of two things. I hear you guys. Um, Dipin is complex. So if I uh, summarize what I've been hearing from you, it's about the hardware aspects, it's about the software aspects, and it's about the economics aspects. So um, from challenges, I would like to move towards solutions. Um, Philip, you mentioned the trusted execution environments uh, just a bit before. Can you give some examples of technologies that you think are going to be viable solutions for, for the long term for dip-ins? What's in your mind? So it's hard to name one because uh, especially during like today, there were so many discussions already either at this panel or other venues when it comes to looking into the aspects of cryptographic primitives that can be used or others. But definitely I will come back to the one that I was already introducing before and this is like that aspects of trusted execution environments. So definitely I see that they are, they have many issues. Let's, let's face it, they are not perfect solutions, but definitely from the aspects of being ready and being in the market, I think they are already around for some time. They can be used and looking into it, for example, on various types of architectures that we can see, we already, they are available on modern CPUs from Intel, AMD or others. They start to be quite usable when it comes to especially the VM-based solutions from uh, Intel or AMD where you can just like deploy a whole of your application stack inside of a Dockerized solution and you are getting this additional security features that basically make it obfuscated to the user and operator of the system where you can actually just run your software in a trusted boundary where unless the TE is compromised, the, the, per, the operator of the node doesn't necessarily know what is happening on it. I think it's very interesting and we also start to see the shift, not only having it on the, comp on the CPU themselves, but shifting it towards GPUs, because of course this is the next step of evolution because at the end when it comes to deployments of machine learning and other aspects, you need additional compute that is provided to you by GPUs and we definitely see the aspects of the security communication already on the PC within between the CPU, the encrypted part of the RAM and also the GPU that allow for applications and trainings of large scale models, enabling the confidential compute uh, as we know. And I think this will be only more developed towards the future because we have to ensure the aspect of trusted IO when it comes to loading the stuff into the enclave and other parts. So I think this is definitely something that will be very exciting. And also on that note, currently we only talked about single TE on a single machine, but I think other aspects will be that we, in especially in a deep end scenario, we want to have multiple manufacturers having different set of TEs and they have to somehow communicate each other, offer comparable uh, security guarantees. And I think it will be also interesting to build up protocols that allow for su such type of solutions as well. So it's definitely something exciting uh, to look into. And the good part, we are not only limited to the classical uh, x86 CPU architectures, but start to see also aspects for ARM CPUs that already are there. Everyone has it in our, our phone as a part of ARM Trust Zone, but we also see, for example, aspects for RISC-V or other types of CPU architectures. So I think this, again, is helping with aspects of heterogeneous uh, setups themselves. Daniel, do you have any... Yeah, this was like, a, I didn't hear the question about the solutions for those problems that happened before, right? Like, for example, this one is a very technical one. Um, we've been in crypto for quite some time and in working with so many projects. If you go to our website, Deepin Hub, you, you can see over 150 Deepin projects that all of them, I sit down and I had a call with them and try to understand those problems. Uh, what we're trying to, to solve is like, Talk to the founders, realize what are the main issues that they have. Sometimes they don't know the, the crypto part. Sometimes they don't know, you know, some of the manufacturing. And we're trying to leverage our expertise as uh, being in this crypto for so long time, for being like a hardware engineer, for being a uh, helping projects. We always try to, if you, uh, if you are like a deep in founder, try to understand your strengths and your weaknesses and ask for help for the weaknesses, for example. There are projects that we're working for, helping them with fulfillment, their project with manufacturing or community. That's one of our strong suits, right? When we're building Hotspotty, which is the fleet management for Helium, we managed to ma 
to we managed to manage 400,000 devices and grow our ecosystem to 300,000 users. Now we're trying to leverage everything that we built in the past and try to help the different projects and offer solutions and partnerships, whatever they need to actually try to solve the code start problem that a lot of those projects have. Founders know hardware, but they don't know community. There's always one key piece missing and we try to close that gap. Solution, yeah, solution. So um, one of the things I can think about top of mind is if you're trying to bootstrap a network, let's say the supply side, there's actually a good sort of, I'm going to go on the GTM side. You can actually go through existing networks and just start it, like build that side of the network and say, hey, go do a deal with, uh, let's say, Huawei that wanted to get some devices or do something that you can actually bootstrap the, the demand side as the supply side. While you do that, try to do the sort of the, the demand side with, with the project that you want to sort of uh, go for. That's that's pretty much worked on the, while we were at Near Foundation, seen a couple of projects do that where they just take the devices and they, they build sort of for the users and the network stabilizes that way. Um, so it's probably one of the advices I, I would I would give. The other thing is maybe it's a bit on the other side, um, not only recognize the strengths, I mean, recognize the weaknesses too, but sometimes double down on the strengths and be okay with the weaknesses sometimes. Because as a founder, you're probably like 10 people team and it's hard to, it's hard to sometimes see the weaknesses, obviously close the gaps, but strengths usually make the, the projects even more like powerful in a sense. So that's one advice I will, I'll give. Okay, uh, solutions to the challenges of uh, different projects. Uh, we, well, we have heard about so many challenges and also solutions. I think we have some good examples of projects solving some aspects for Deepin's data availability layers for like collecting the data off chain, making it provably available to blockchain applications user adoption, facilitating the adoption of uh, miners and uh, deep in machines and the hardware. So yeah, let me again bore you a little bit more with some more technical, uh, more solutions to technical challenges. Um, and uh, I've mentioned some, some issues. I think one solution to these technical challenges I've mentioned is for a deep in project is to possibly refer to an existing infrastructure that can solve, if not all, most of these technical issues so that you can focus on the actual pin logic and not on the cryptographic schemes or the decentralized protocols that are required to make everything work. In general, you need to I mean, at least we have identified like a layered architecture for Deepin. In this layered architecture, we provide several critical layers to solve some critical issues. So one layer is of course the layer one, which is the token economy layer. Then, then uh, you can choose from a layer two for verifiable computation. And we have also solved the hardware, hardware abstraction layer. So how you design and program your hardware in a way that it is uh, Web3 ready, as well as how you identify these devices and these owners with uh, a decentralized identity layer. These are some technical solutions that are needed by any deep in projects. They are not solving all the problems, right? There are uh, problems like how do I store this data so for short term and how do I store them for long term, right? Uh, as well as how do I stream this data out of the device and how do I sequence this data to like achieve scalability, right? Before I can actually do some computation. These are still some open challenges that other projects actually are solving very well and hopefully we will see more uh, solutions to come in the future. All right, uh, we've heard quite a lot about uh, technical solutions out there. So um, I want to pick your brains on the forward-looking view on how the business of Deepin is going to do in the future. 
So here I'm thinking that where we are today at most of the dip in businesses are actually charging service fees for the services that they offer. And my question for you is, what do you think is going to be another way to monetize the services in the future? Are we going to stay with service fees or are there going to be other business models out there that will help deep in businesses to be increasingly viable? Uh, I know it's a hard one, so who would like to, to start here? Okay, Daniel. No, absolutely, right? I think uh, the, the, the first easiest, more easy way is someone to just pay for the service. But uh, I like to think, you know, for example, Facebook, you use Facebook for free. And if you're not paying for the service, you are the service. That's something that we like to say, right? And I think the DP model, a lot of things that you're going to be building actually by providing some sort your time is, is valuable. So uh, there's a lot of use, a lot of ways that people can pay for those services. And that could be with your time. And if you watch some ad, you know, you get rewarded in tokens. Uh, I, I like business models that you become a shareholder of that project by actually using it. You're going to be, you know, offering the supply, but also maybe being the demand. And, and then you have like a circular economy that goes around that project and the pro around that, those tokens. And I think that's a really interesting way of thinking of those things. Like your time is money or there are, are tokens. Uh, and I think that's a different way of thinking as well. And uh, if you don't want to pay with fiat, you can pay with your time for watching ads. And that's just a one, one example. Uh, Philip, what do you think? Is your time also tokens or uh, how, do you, how do you refer to that? I would say yes, but it depends on the night, right? It can be like one part is like you're watching an advertisement, but it can also be by providing value to the deep end, right? You can help with educating people in the community. You can help onboard new users. And I think you can be also rewarded for, for other activities that you do for the overall infrastructure that you actually plan to use. So in that sense, I think time is maybe a good approach, but it can be, there can be additional innovation on actually how do you reward the person's time because Maybe also like the expertise you can bring to the table might not be same for, for everyone. And might be also more engaging for people to share their expertise than just watching advertisements as well. So maybe there'll be some aspects of innovation on that front. Yeah, that's a very good question, actually. Um, interesting to think about it. Uh, what comes to my mind is that uh, I think it's basically what um, Philip said, right? It's all about value contribution. I'm sure, I mean, there will always be a token in a deep in project that somehow accounts for the service provided by, by and to use it. However, it not necessarily, most probably deep in projects will never be so simple. Uh, we are witnessing some initial projects, but 100% deep in involves the physical world where we don't have uh, like a protocol that can verify what we are doing. So 100% there will, there, there will be many roles right into a Debian project, not only users and service providers. There will be witnesses. There will be, I don't know, maintenance. There will be, um, yeah, verify, physical people verifying uh, uh, maybe even with the use of other machines that have a different role into this ecosystem. So eventually, somehow you will be probably paying this service with a token, but how did you make that token? Not necessarily buying the token, right? But maybe contributing to the network in a different way that made you earn that token and then using it for paying the service. How this will evolve, I'm really like eager to, to see it. Went deep in ETF, that, that would solve all the problems <laughs> uh, on the buy side. But um, yeah, leaving that aside, I guess, uh, devices. So we were connected to uh, everywhere, right, with the phones. So the business model I always love to see and kind of like is like the Brave bottle where, you know, you contribute as a user and then you get something out of it. Um, and that's, that's probably what I like. I like seeing, uh, so giving the power to the users and probably uh, also relates to uh, Nier's vision now, which is user-owned AI. Um, how do we kind of build those models sustainably uh, and along the way get an ETF would be great. You've heard it from them, uh, deep in ETF. Parting thoughts. Uh, what do you want the audience to 
take away and go home and think about uh, when it comes to, to dip in. Um, Daniel, you're smiling. Um, sure, like I always start, right? <clears throat> Uh, I can. I mean, I can. I guess I can do a quick plug on what we're doing. Like, uh, we're focused on deepinhub.io, and I think what I would like the people to actually go home and do is like go and subscribe to our newsletter. Not just because I'm trying to promote anything silly, but we're building a lot of things that are gonna give users and their moms and their families a lot of opportunities to get onboarded into crypto. We want to try to find ways that. They can onboard and start earning some passive income, so semi-passive income, being part of the deep in revolution without having to really, you know, be too technical. So this a, it's a small plug there, but I think it's going to be worth it for everyone that does it. <laughs> so I think on the similar front is like the aspect of education, maybe more on the technical front because we already, when we are, for example, working with students that are just about to graduate from universities, many of these concepts actually are quite new to them. And even though they are just about to enter the job market, actually many times they have to catch up a lot on the technical aspects actually already as well. So definitely I think looking into the aspects of the fundamentals that are actually contributing to building such decentralized infrastructure is definitely something that people should be looking into because at the end these technologies will be hopefully more and more around. And we somehow should, I think, in general, increase the bar of the knowledge of, of the people that will be using this, the systems, but also building on top of them and maybe uh, building and helping to gain the mass adoption. So I think in that sense, the general expertise should be rather invested into people learning and understanding the fundamentals a bit more in detail. So how do you go on? Basically, like, um, I've realized I'm not a deep and expert, so I would do my homework. And, and learn a bit more about Deepin myself. That's always uh, how to improve yourself in everything you do. Um, the other thing is always, um, I guess, it, check, check us out at Nuffle Labs. We work with IOTX. We give it the sort of the experts what they, uh, they want to use our infrastructure for. Uh, yeah, so uh, follow us at Nuffle Labs. And uh, we just, yeah, we actually, our Twitter just got what's well, like turned down for no reason that we don't know. So we still need decentralized social. So that's kind of another thing I've seen today. But yeah. Simone, last words from you. No, I'm not asking them to bring, uh, I mean, anything more than I've already said. Just uh, enjoy the space. We are very happy you came and uh, to have you here uh, bring some cocktail and beer to home, whatever. <laughs> and uh, yeah, enjoy your time here. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. And uh, to our audience, if you've learned anything new today, please clap your hands uh, for our panelists.